There are 294,000 religious congregations in the United States. Protestant, Catholic, and Jewish traditions share a commitment to social justice. They shelter the homeless, feed the hungry, and provide counseling, health care, and daycare to those in need. Working together with elected officials at local, state, and national levels, faith-based individuals are making an impact. Welcome to Making an Impact. My name is Lynn Landsberg and I will be filling in this segment for our regular moderator, Gretchen Eich. Since the recent death of Ryan White, the 18-year-old AIDS sufferer, the issue of AIDS and the AIDS epidemic itself has been brought into the homes of Americans across the country. Americans have been reading about AIDS in the newspaper, they have been watching stories about AIDS on TV, and whether they're ready to or not, they have been dealing with the issue of AIDS in their hearts and in their minds. It is timely, therefore, that our guests this evening deal with the issue of AIDS every day of their lives. It's my pleasure to welcome today our guests, Ken South, who is the public policy advocate for ANIN, the AIDS National Interfaith Network, and Billy Jones, the director of minority affairs programs at the National AIDS Network. Now, both of you work for organizations um, who do excellent work in the field of AIDS, and it's a pleasure to have you here this evening, so welcome. Thank you. It's good to be Thank here. Thank you. Is it okay if I call you Billy and Ken? Please. Great. Ken, I understand that your organization is, although the two of your organizations are complementary, your organization has a special spin to it, and that you are a UCC, United Church of Christ, ordained minister and have been so for 18 years. That's right. Can you tell me about your organization? Well, ANIN, uh, the AIDS National Interfaith Network, came together uh, just two years ago um, as a response to um, the issue that uh, really over the course of the last 10 years there's been a tremendous growth of faith-based AIDS organizations around the country. Um, every major denomination in the United States, the Episcopals and Presbyterians, United Church of Christ, Methodists, Lutherans, uh, the major denominations, has been making, making progress in providing services for people with AIDS. Uh, in many cases, it's community-based. It's communities across the country. But up until uh, just two years ago, there was no central focus of all these organizations. So and an address for all of these organizations, too. Well, and a coalition, so that the, they could be working with each other and communicating with each other. Mm -hmm. So uh, in New York two years ago, a meeting was called of all the national denominations that were doing anything in AIDS, uh, came together and said, yes, we need to talk to each other, we need to have an organization, we need to coordinate and cooperate with each other. And um, so they formed the AIDS National Interfaith Network, which is a Catholic, Protestant, and Jewish, and um, is, a, is a really like a traditional trade association, but between AIDS organizations that are found in the faith community. And Billy, yours is a complementary organization. How does it function? The National AIDS Network is an organization that provides uh, training and technical assistance mm -hmm. to about 700 uh, community-based AIDS service organizations that are providing uh, services or doing education and prevention uh, to diverse populations within diverse communities. Is there much overlap in your membership? I know that all of your community-based uh, organizations are not necessarily religious, correct? That's correct, and there is overlap in our memberships, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What do you do every day of your lives? You, you're, you have a particular slant to the job that you do. What is that? Uh, <laughs> well, my job at the moment is uh, as Director of Minority Affairs Programs, I am primarily addressing, helping uh, minority-based, minority-focused, or minority-specific programs 
to in a number of areas. Sometimes it's merely getting started. Sometimes it's identifying resources. Often it's connecting them with similar organizations that may have a little bit more start. Uh, it's mostly helping organizations to not reinvent the wheel, to uh, get the most out of their dollars and to provide quality services uh, to the constituency in which they're trying to target. And how about that constituency? Is it being truly served? Is it being served as other constituencies are, are served? Or are there special problems? Well, there are always special problems. Uh, I think for the most part, we can say that aid service organizations do an incredible amount of work uh, for the a very limited amount of money. There, there's a misconception in the community, I think, that there is too much money perhaps being addressed to AIDS, but that in terms of the work that we're trying to do in terms of uh, addressing a very serious crisis that is a part of many other crises in the community, such as substance abuse and teenage pregnancy, in which AIDS is a part of that. Um, AIDS service organizations doing a um, monumental job. Are the churches helping in any way? Are, are we out there in force doing what our share? Well, I think uh, you know, there's a range of opinion about that. First of all, just in terms of the evidence. The evidence shows that the, the religious community is, is doing a tremendous amount in the area of, of AIDS in response to the AIDS epidemic. Uh, some people would say that uh, the religious community is a little bit late that it took a little time for the religious community to respond at the level that we need to be responding at. Mm -hmm. There might be some truth to that criticism. Um, the church and the religious community um, is, has always been, at least the, the, the denominations that I work with, has always been at the forefront of poverty issues, of race issues, of justice issues. Um, so that is where AIDS is. And um, so um, I think one of the, the probably the, the um, worst told stories is is this tremendous response that has that has come from the traditional yeah, the, from the traditional mainline churches? I think one of the problems has been that the um, the far right or the more fundamentalist um, of the uh, of our brothers and sisters mm -hmm. in the faith community have kind of taken the agenda. I think the newspaper, I think the the media has has capitalized on on their concerns about lifestyle, about about sex, about homosexuality, about IV drug use, about uh, sex education, about condom use, and these are kind of sexy um, you know issues for newspapers. And people think that that is the church response, and it's not. That's a very small part of the response. Um, but the growth, tremendous growth, I would, I would be willing to be challenged on this, that I think that the, the, the response of the, of the religious community uh, is now the fastest growing response in terms of the um, organization of nonprofit and the organization on a community-based level. Because in a lot of cases, the, um, in, in the major areas where the AIDS epidemic is, the the community-based agencies are in place, and they're growing, but they are in place in those cities. Mm -hmm. uh, they need to be, and will be growing more and more in, in minority communities, for sure. And we also will see a growth in community-based agencies that will deal specifically with IV drug users. I think it's going to be a new wave as well in the future. But uh, especially in smaller communities and, and in tandem in larger communities, the faith-based response has been incredible. But it's been a terribly told story. Why People is it? It's hard it. for me. I mean, I believe what you're saying, and I know from my own experience I have seen churches and synagogues involved with AIDS work. But the story out there, and what we hear more often than not, is the theology of punishment mm -hmm. rather than the theology of compassion. Um, you're saying that's not, that's not what's happening, or at least that's not the whole story. How is the AIDS-affected community responding to the church's outreach? Well, I think there's mixed response to um, how the community expects the uh, religious community to respond and how the religious community has actually responded. Mm -hmm. uh, those religious institutions that have traditionally responded uh, to the social uh, problems within the community are perhaps those same institutions that are taking the lead mm -hmm. in responding to AIDS and with a sense of compassion and responding as opposed to reacting. Mm -hmm. Those religious institutions which have been most rigid in terms of morality issues and focus on behaviors uh, 
of individuals and sort of the hell and damnation mm -hmm. have also been those institutions in which we hear the horror stories of individuals not being able to attend church service, being refused communion, mm -hmm. uh, ministers who would not uh, bury the individuals, persons actually being excommunicated from the church. Those are the type of horror stories. And those are also the stories that the media tend to play up to and that's, and that's one segment of the right. church society and I would imagine that the truly compassionate churches the churches that have been out on the front lines on this issue from the get-go or maybe a little late are the other end of the spectrum but that broad spectrum in between that spectrum that really represents probably uh, the largest number of church goers is probably a little late and scared and don't know how to respond and how do you reach those people do you have an outreach to those churches that are not yet there or not yet jumping into the fray? Yeah, a big, a big part of what uh, the, the faith-based AIDS organization is, 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 an, is an array or a panorama of, of this church response. In some cases, in a small community, it comes about because one congregation experienced AIDS in their congregation. Uh -huh. And so they will form a committee, and they will say, what are we going to do? We found AIDS in our congregation. And they will ask other, other churches to join them. Um, and that may be for a while a task force, you know. It may just be an educational thing where they will spend a lot of their time educating their own churches, and that will be their AIDS program. Uh, I'm going to a local um, program here of a local church here in Maryland that's doing a five-week seminar on AIDS in their church. And um, they, will, they will join with other groups around them. Now, it may, that's just an educational effort, but it's a very important effort. Uh, in many cases, in mainline denominations, there may not be, in fact, in that denomination or in that, in that congregation, many people with AIDS. But the fact is that uh, in a lot of cases, there will be families of people who have, who have AIDS who have moved to other cities, and yet the family is in that congregation. The aunt and the uncle, the grandmother, the mother and the father, mm -hmm. who get a letter or a phone call and find out that their son or their daughter has AIDS. Mm -hmm. And then who is there to support them? That's right. That and has been the response, and there's been tremendous response. To that, that's terrific, and I, we'll get back to that right after this uh, message. Thanks. My brother wouldn't listen to me. I told him, you have sex, you use condoms so you don't get AIDS. He laughed and said condoms were macho. My brother, he was so macho. Welcome back. We are talking today with Ken South and Billy Jones, both working with AIDS networking organizations. We're talking about the challenge AIDS poses for the religious community. I would say, Billy, you're a social worker, correct? Yes. Uh, so you see people outside the pew as, or outside the church as well. Where is the epidemic now? We've heard all kinds of things, that it's stabilized in the gay community, that it's on the rise in the uh, teenage community. What's, uh, what's the truth? Well, the truth is that AIDS is still affecting the same people today that it was affecting two years ago or five years ago, but disproportionately uh, affecting some groups. Those groups that have historically been... Uh, have histories of oppression because of racism, sexism, homophobia, and classism that have disproportionately been impacted by other social problems and health issues such as communities of color, uh, the black, Hispanic, Asian, and Native American community, uh, women who are in codependent relationship mm -hmm. with men. Are, those are the communities that are disproportionately impacted. Youth are... are considered at risk because youth for the most part don't think of themselves as being vulnerable to any mm -hmm. disease. Right. Uh, so the communities have only believed and are still caught in the media uh, portrayal of AIDS as a gay disease. I mean remember we used to call this GRID, gay related immune That's deficiency syndrome. We have not been able to undo that. So what we're seeing is that there is the belief that the crisis is only in the gay white male community. That is definitely not true. There's also the myth that 
the crisis is over and it is beginning to subside uh -huh. within the gay community. A very dangerous. That also rumor. is not true. We're beginning to see uh, increasing numbers, a shift toward rural and small and middle-sized mm -hmm. areas, it's still climbing numbers and disproportionate numbers within uh, the black and Hispanic community, greater, far more greater increase among women mm -hmm. and teenagers, larger numbers of pediatric cases, and among heterosexuals. And the solution, I think, is that we must all take some responsibilities for addressing a crisis. And do we all take responsibility? We don't. Unfortunately, we still wait until the disease knocks on our door. Mm -hmm. uh, and until individuals feel personally impacted by the disease, we, we tend to be very passive about it and say, it's their problem and not my problem. Now, I think the, the, we may have that problem in some of our churches, in some of our communities, but probably the, the community that has been uh, least able to look with a with very clear vision at this issue is uh, our legislators, both in, on the state level and, and in Congress. And that's where actually both of you come in. Uh, Ken, you are a, a, a public policy advocate, which is a very nice nonprofit way of saying uh, lobbyist yes, yes. for the it's issue. the L word. Uh, the, the L word, that's right. <laughs> what, uh, what do you see happening on the horizon as far as legislation? Well, on the immediate horizon, we have two very exciting pieces of legislation going on in Congress right now. Um, one is the ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act, is uh, working its way through Congress. It will now go before the Judiciary Committee and then to the floor of the House. It's already been passed by the Senate. The ADA is a very important bill. First of all, it's the Civil Rights Bill for people with disabilities. Mm -hmm. And included in that is uh, people with AIDS, because people with AIDS are defined as having a disability. Mm -hmm. um, this, it's been... One of my previous lives, I worked as staff of the President's Commission on HIV, and it was clear in the testimony before the President's Commission and the National Commission now and every other commission that uh, the barrier of discrimination is a barrier that is uh, not only um, uh, a horrible experience for people to go through who are HIV positive or mm -hmm. have AIDS, but is also a barrier to prevention. Mm -hmm. And uh, as long as people are, can lose their jobs and lose their, uh, lose their houses and, and, um, um, and be unable to work uh, because of blatant discrimination, which is based really uh, on nothing, um, then that, that, that slows down and that hurts the epidemic. So what you're saying is this more. bill, the ADA bill, would protect those basics of somebody's life. Exactly right. Mm -hmm. It gives people the civil rights protections uh, who are HIV positive. Mm -hmm. So for the AIDS community, it's a vital bill. We've been fighting for this for years and years and years. It is the bill that that really must be passed to provide this, this prevention, uh, to provide justice, first of all, for people who are HIV infected, but then beyond that, also to help the public health community to uh, with prevention of this disease. The second bill that's really essential also is the uh, Kennedy-Hatch AIDS Care Bill, uh, the Comprehensive AIDS Resor uh, Resources Emergency Bill of 1990, which will provide direct emergency monies uh, to the 15 top cities that are really in a financial crisis. Mm -hmm. uh, many of our hospitals are now in, 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 a, in a real a gridlock mm -hmm. uh, and are at a triage level of mm -hmm. making decisions hour by hour about who gets care and who doesn't. Um, and it also provides service money for other communities to provide comprehensive home care services, nursing services um, for people with AIDS and the rest of the community. It's and a, does it's that a vital have a piece future? of legislation. First oh, of all, yes, let's start from the beginning. Did I hear you correctly? Did you say Kennedy Hatch? Yes. Is that an interesting... Well, no, they, they have provided a very good, uh, bipart this is a bipartisan bill, mm -hmm. and uh, it, uh, coming from the Senate, it will have a, a companion bill uh, introduced by Representative Waxman uh, from the House. And, uh, does it have a future? It certainly does. It's moving rather rapidly. In fact, it should be on the floor of the Senate uh, within a few weeks. Mm -hmm. um, it's already passed uh, out of committee with uh, no amendments and, and, uh, and has got good support. So um, it's, it's really a vital bill, and people need to contact the legislators and support it. Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, go ahead, Billy. What's important to remember, and to, whether from a policy position or a program or a service position, is that we have to recognize that you cannot address AIDS in a vacuum if you're really mm -hmm. serious right. about this. And almost any piece of legislation that comes up in Congress, or whether it's on a state piece of legislation, uh, it impacts persons with AIDS. Uh, it impacts the services and the efforts to address 
the AIDS crisis, and I know that AIDS Action Council has made the statement that you can have the best program going, and if a part of your strategy does not include, include uh, looking at policies and doing that lobbying, then uh, you're not doing the total uh, mm -hmm. range of your work. You have to take time out and get involved in lobbying and legislative work. Uh, so what we're learning in terms of a comprehensive approach is that if we're looking at AIDS just in a vacuum, we have a problem. But if we look at AIDS and substance abuse, mm -hmm. AIDS and housing, uh, mm -hmm. AIDS and home care, uh, AIDS and immigration, mm -hmm. uh, any, any issue you can name, AIDS and envi environment, uh, regardless of what it is, there is something there that is related mm -hmm. it to, crosses to this all crisis. Issue boundaries. And mm -hmm. because of that, mm -hmm. we have to be on the hill. We have to be on top of, we have to make our programs make sense with policies. Mm -hmm. And we have to make the policies make sense according to the programs that are needed. And from a minority perspective, it's making sure that all individuals have access to care, access to treatment, ex you know, reasonable educational programs that actually targets the gamut and the range mm -hmm. of the uh, hard to reach populations that are out there in the hey, community. To me, you're talking sense. This, it, it, it sounds right. How do you respond to the allegations that the AIDS community has too powerful a lobby and is uh, demanding too much and getting too much? Well, it's interesting, though, we've heard that and we've seen that around. The fact is, there's always the myth and the fact. The fact is this powerful lobby on the Hill, there are four full-time AIDS lobbyists on the Hill. Mm -hmm. uh, I wouldn't want to begin to compare that to the, to the Manufacturers Association or the American Medical Association or to the other kinds of lobbyists that we have Take on the Take a wild guess just for our viewers' sake. Uh, right. of, of, of the kind of uh, the, the, the core of lobbyists for other organizations. Well, the there's hundreds. So uh, the point is, while there are many organizations that, that have, uh, are doing AIDS uh, public policy work, mm -hmm. uh, and many organizations that have lobbyists that are helping with, with AIDS public policy uh, efforts, they also have other agendas uh, in their work. But really, there are, there are, there's one major AIDS lobbying organization, the AIDS Action Council, which does an excellent job, and there's a coalition called NORA, the National Organizations Responding to AIDS, of some hundred and 50 public policy agencies that cover a wide range of, of issues um, but have an interest in AIDS. But when you come right down to um, actual full-time AIDS lobbyists, talking about four full-time people. So hardly uh, it's not a huge lobby. The fact is, though, that the work that Nora does and the work that the AIDS Action Council does, uh, they do excellent work. And the fact is that the epidemic is still bigger than all of us, and um, that the need is always greater than what the resources will be. Mm -hmm. So um, there's always this, uh, you learn quickly on the Hill, there's always opposition to everything. Um, but uh, I think that the, the, um, the need is certainly there. And, and I think uh, up until now, there has been, um, uh, the response has certainly not been e even as much as we would like. Mm -hmm. And the, th the threat, I think, to us is that there are always legislators who want to legislate uh, our efforts to address the crisis in ways that inhibit us or limit us. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there's a constant threat as we attempt to address the AIDS crisis in culturally appropriate ways that make sense for very specific populations. There is always the those who would try to say, you cannot say this in a certain way, you cannot do this mm -hmm. in a certain way. And that, that always becomes a problem. So we, we need individuals to actually, who, who, can, who understand the community on a very grassroots level, mm -hmm. to, to constantly be speaking up and saying, this is what we have to do. And we need legislation to protect people's basic civil rights and make sure services are provided, but not legislation to inhibit Mm -hmm. the, the, the work that has been proven to be effective. For example, mm -hmm. outreach work, uh, in which outreach workers actually go into the street and work with addicts who are not in treatment program, and many of them are not in treatment program because treatment is not available upon demand, mm -hmm. or outreach workers that may be looking at needle exchange programs, and the reason that they share needle is because the legislation says that you can't buy them across the counter. So of course they share. <laughs> so it sounds like it's an uphill battle, uh, or at least you always have to watch what 
what the opposition may have ahead of you. I am assuming that four lobbyists don't sway Congress, that it is, as you say, the grassroots um, back at home exactly. that ultimately affect the votes. Tell us what members of churches can do to help the cause both at home and here on the Hill. Well, anyone who's involved with, with any of the, uh, say, mainline denominations is in touch with their, their public policy offices in Washington, and most of them are at the Methodist Building in Washington, uh, 110 Maryland Avenue. Um, all have, uh, are part of another organization called WISC, the Washington Interfaith Staff uh, Council. Mm -hmm. And within that organization, we have an HIV working group. Mm -hmm. um, Anan provides to, uh, to those denominations up constant updates on what's going on with AIDS legislation, mm -hmm. and they distribute that information through what are generally called action alerts to their people in their denominations. They write articles in their denominational newsletters so that people are kept up to date on what's going on with legislation. So once they get this information at home, and very often they get it through National Impact, which is the organization say, national, supporting this Yes, National this Impact show. has helped a great deal with action alerts on, uh, on, on mm -hmm. ADA. Once they get that information, what do they do? The typical thing, but it's so hard to get people to do it, but it's very, absolutely vital, is to write and to call their legislator. Okay. Very important. Great. On, on that note, we end. Thank you very much. Let's listen to this advice, and thanks for being with us. Sometimes I feel my dreams don't matter, that I am just too small.